No one can hear me without this mic. I'm accused of talking softly. How's everyone doing? Great turnout. Too bad we weren't doing this yesterday afternoon when it was about 70 degrees, but so it is. Uh, so as Brian said, I'm Brian Holtzclaw. I'm the mayor. With me is Stephanie Vignal, a deputy mayor. I've been on, my, on the council, this is my 11th year. It's kind of hard to believe. It's, uh, the end of my third term will be my final term. I ran for a third term because there's two things that I wanted to see through to fruition that I'll talk about in a minute. It was against my wife's wishes, so I have spousal imposed term limits, so I'm done after next year. Um, I want to start by saying I'm probably having the most fun in the last two years on council that I've had in my time over 11 years. Um, I think we were charting a course for it as a council and as a city leadership team and as a city as a whole and that we're moving us forward in that direction rather than just going in circles. We're going to try to provide you an update of what's going on, some of the major issues that we're working on we're going to be dealing with. I'm excited. I, I think I feel it from the rest of the council too when we have our discussions. There's a lot of good stuff going on, uh, which is a big change. Um, I'll hit on that here in a minute. But between the two of us, what I'm going to do is there's six areas I'd like to cover. I'd like to talk about general city operations, the city's financial position, talk about our strategic plan, which is on a little small board up here, update you on the comprehensive plan, the DRCC, and then I'll talk about the ARPA implementation with the money we got from the federal government. And then Stephanie's going to take over and talk about public safety and talk about, um, what's the other item? Legislating. And, and as, I go, as we go through, we're going to try to identify what we see as some of the opportunities and some of the challenges we face ahead of us. Um, I can mostly skip the next section I've written down because people already said all the thank yous I was going to thank. But I do want to call out the Chamber and, and Jeff Ritter and, and Greg Elwin. They're doing a great job and we've been, been working hard on building that relationship over the last two years. And, you know, the businesses in our community all around us are the key to our success, so I think I look forward to that partnership growing. And thank you for April Berg and Senator Levick for showing up. I think we we'll also have very strong relationships with our delegation. They work extremely hard on our behalf down in the neighborhood. And uh, we look forward to continuing to work with them in the upcoming session. So I'll start with the city operations. I mean, the strength of our city is not the council, it's our staff. Um, I want to recognize our city manager, Martin Yamamoto. We have our deputy city manager here somewhere, Aurora Brock. Our director of public works and community development, Director Todd. I think our human resources director, Naomi, is here somewhere. Ermina, where is Ermina? I saw her earlier. There's Ermina there. Adrian Garcia, he keeps changing his titles with the city, so I can't keep track of it. And then Chief White back there with and also acknowledge our representatives from South County Fire. Thank you for coming here today. I didn't know which jacket to bring today when I woke up. I threw a rain jacket, a puffer jacket, and a windbreaker in the car. Unfortunately, we're covered here, so. Um, you know, our staff, the public doesn't see it, and even the council doesn't fully see it, how hard they work, whether it's on a Friday evening getting the agendas out, or getting materials together, or in response to a windstorm, getting our streets cleaned, or preparing for a snowstorm. They work incredibly hard on our behalf. And one thing I wanted to call out that I think is a little bit unique for our city is we've had a lot of promotion from within. And I almost forgot to add this, it really started when Council Member, former Council Member Todd promoted himself from council on to the director of public works and community development. But just go around our leadership team. Uh, where's Martin? Martin was hired as our deputy city manager, he's now our city manager. Laura was hired as our finance director, who's now deputy city manager. Adrian was hired as an assistant city clerk and then was city clerk and now as a programs analyst, I think is his new title. Whereas Naomi was hired as our city clerk and is now our HR director. So but I think that shows the strength of the organization that we're providing opportunities for people to grow and prosper within, within the city. I think the other thing I'm happy about with city operations is we've had a level of stability that we haven't had in a number of years. Um, you know, I enjoy going to my mayor's meetings now because I have mayors tell me, hey, what's going on in Mill Creek? I don't see anything in the papers about you. 
that's a good thing because if we're in the papers, it's not for the right reason. So that, take that as a very, um, as a big compliment. I think it's important to keep in mind the size of our city and where we're at with regards to our population. We currently are budgeted for 61 FTEs and we have 58 of those positions filled. We're looking for a planning manager, a city clerk, and a surface water coordinator. To put that in perspective, when I joined the council in 2014, I don't have the exact number, and Director Todd will correct me if I'm wrong, but I want to say we we're in the low 70s, somewhere between 70 and 74 FTEs, and that was for a population that was about two to 3,000 fewer than what we have today. So we have a smaller staff working harder for us on a daily basis. Um, the other thing with the staff that I think is important is we have a very strong morale. We have a great, I, we see it with the way staff interacts and works together with themselves. And we have a great working relationship between staff and council, which is a big key to us being able to get stuff done on, on the residents' behalf. Sorry, I was prepared for a podium. I didn't realize this was going to be a big city chat, so pardon me why I changed the pages. Um, but one of the big initiatives we've had both as a staff and as a council is to make sure we're educating and we're getting the information out to the public. And I think one of the things the city suffered from in the past is not being good communicators. And when we don't communicate, that creates voids, and those voids tend to be filled with speculation and misinformation. Uh, so Jody and Scott, I, I forgot to recognize them, I apologize to Jody and Scott for what they do, but they're doing a fantastic job with, on, the, on the communications front, on the social media, and getting the word out to everyone of what we have going on and the information that needs to get out. Um, let's give a big round of applause for all of our staff. We wouldn't be here without them. So, I mean, to me, the biggest challenge we have on the staff in front is retaining our staff and attracting new staff. You know, it's, all the cities are competing for the same personnel that we are. We saw this when we were trying to hire engineers a few years ago. All the jurisdictions are looking for engineers. Um, so we need to make sure that we remain competitive so we can both attract new employees when we have openings and retain who we have. But we also have a big opportunity here, which I'll talk about in a little more detail, to what I will call right-sizing the city, because I don't think that we are staffed appropriately for what our residents expect and want to see with our city going forward. Finances. Finances are strong. The city is in a good position. And it's another thing I'm proud of, is when I go to my mayor's meetings, I hear other mayors that are telling horror stories of the financial situations they're dealing with. Uh, we can be, we're very fortunate that uh, we have, are in a strong financial position. The council, uh, we all have different political beliefs, but we're all united in the, being fiscally responsible with the community's dollars. There, there are dollars, there are your dollars, and we want to make sure they're spent wisely. Um, this year will be my sixth and final budget process, and this I'm anticipating will be the fifth straight balanced budget that we will adopt without dipping into the general, uh, general fund reserve, which I think is a big accomplishment. You know, that was when we started moving to a balanced budget. That was the big concern, is how do we sustain this? Not just balance it for two years, but sustain it two, four, eight, ten years down the road. And we've been able to do that. Uh, I don't know if it's by luck, good fortune, or being smart, but maybe it's a combination all the above. One of the things that's always interested me in the budget process is every two years it seems we're presented with a graph that shows what the general fund reserve is going to do five or six years out and it always shows that that's going to be dropping precipitously um, I'm ten years into this and I'm waiting for it to drop so um, hopefully we can make that continue right now we're projected to, to end 2024 with a general fund reserve of a little over nine million dollars so a little bit of an asterisk to that. Historically, we've had about six to seven million dollars in reserves. Our reserve policies call for us to move a certain amount of money uh, over for capital projects, which in response to COVID, we deferred. So we'll be having that discussion in the fall. I anticipate that we will move some money into the capital projects, which would pull our general fund reserve back to the six to seven million dollar level, but still very healthy and we've managed to maintain it for the last 10 years and hopefully we'll be able to maintain it for the next 10. 
But we do have a big discussion we need to have as a community about the size of our staff. When COVID hit a little over what, four years ago, and four years and a month when the stay-at-home order hit us, the city tightened its belt. We had a lot of uh, turnover and there was a lot of positions we didn't fill. We cut pretty lean. Um, you know, looking back, it was the right thing to do, but I don't know that we're staffed to meet the expectations of the residents for making sure the parks are maintained, the roads are swept. So one of the big changes that we had in the last year was the voters approved the fire annexation to South County, and we're glad that we did that, we're glad the voters approved it with 75% vote. When we did that, our end of the bargain was we were going to reduce our city levy by the amount that we would have had to pay for the fire contract, which we, we did. I was a little surprised, Motley Terrace and Briar followed us with annexations, both successful, both with higher percentages, and they gave back none of the money to the residents. They kept their city levy the same. What that means for us is we have what they call banked capacity. Uh, we have about $2.3 million. We're not looking to spend all of it, but it gives us the opportunity to look at where our needs are as a city and where we can add staff to accomplish some of the priorities that we've identified going forward. So that's a big discussion that we're going to be having in the, in the, in the fall. We're going to ask staff to bring to us a, a plan of where is it? Is it more police officers? Is it more public work staff? Is it more marketing communications? Where do we need that um, help? So we can have a discussion of whether we should use some of that bank capacity to, like I said, right-size the city staff for what our residents expect. So the challenges going forward are, of course, maintaining that general fund reserve that we've managed to do, but also looking for new revenue sources. Uh, we're largely a built-out community, so we don't have the same level of development fees and the like that we've had in the past that helped build up that reserve during the, the housing boom for over 15 years ago. At the same time, like I said, with the, one of the opportunities is using some of that bank capacity to right-size the city, but also looking at how we can uh, use the comprehensive plan update, which I'm going to get to in a minute, uh, and the DRCC property uh, development of that to provide some economic development for the city to help provide some revenue sources. Now, in my 10 years on the council, I would say during the first seven years, we probably very sporadically took the time to do retreats to look beyond the next year or so, year or two. And that's why uh, Stephanie and I in the last three years have tried to institute doing an annual retreat every January where we take an opportunity uh, to take a step back from the day-to-day. -day. It seems that I think government often gets stuck in a rut of dealing with the day-to-day -day, uh, issues that come up. It's always this, that, or the other thing, uh, it seems. And we never take the time to take a step back and look at where we want to go. So we've been consciously as a council and as a staff been trying to do that with these leadership retreats and identify our priorities for the coming year, but also trying to look out three to five years. Last year we set a different goal. We wanted to look out farther than five years. We wanted to put together a longer range strategic vision. And so we hired Rob Fenty from 1961 consultant, a Consulting in Portland, who's helped guide us through the process that has resulted in, and I encourage you to come up and look at it after the meeting. I'll kind of summarize it. But we came up with a strategic vision and some guiding principles going forward. And to me, this is important because if we don't know, we got a chart of court, we have to identify where we want to go and then figure out how to get there. Otherwise, we're just going to go around in circles and not get anything done and just deal with the day to day. Um, so the vision that we've identified, and we're kind of rolling this out today and we're going to have it discussed at the city chat next month before we finalize it, but the vision we've identified is that in 2040, Mill Creek is a thriving, connected, and safe community characterized by its walkability, well-maintained parks and trails, safe and clean public spaces, and strong community engagement. With four guiding principles, financial health and economic vitality, safe and clean, engaged and connected community, well-maintained outdoors, public spaces, and infrastructure. So our hope is that this is going to provide kind of our north star, so to speak. That will be the framework for all the city decision making, whether it's a public works project, whether it's a marketing and communications issue. But 
I think it's important for us as a community to have that North Star so we can put decisions in some kind of uh, some kind of context. There's a little more detail in each one of the guiding principles. I encourage you to read when, if you have a chance afterwards. But part of the reason this is important is I think it's going to shift us away from identifying annual priorities for the city staff, which I think have the effect of this. Moving the goalposts every year on the staff, which I know leads to a lot of frustration. And so now we're trying to use this to set more three to five year priorities, which we started to identify last night, so that we can have a little more consistency and not put staff on on the uh, the yo yo on a yo yo so to speak. So the challenges going forward are to keep doing these annual retreats. Um, I think they've been very helpful and critical to the city. And my hope is that this strategic vision we've come up with doesn't end up sitting on the shelf collecting dust. I hope it remains a document that we use to guide all the decision making in the city. And at the same time, this is our opportunity to guide our decisions going forward. And so I think council is excited where this process came out. I think we had a lot of discussion last year and a lot of disagreement and it took a lot of time to come to an understanding of what a strategic plan was and what it meant and what it wasn't. But we got there and we're pretty close to having something finalized and I'm pretty excited about it. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the comp plan and this was one of the reasons why I wanted to run for a third term to come back. I mean, growth is one of the major issues we have to deal with as a community. It's something we hear about the most. Um, as some of you know, got to the As some of you know, my background for 30 plus years is in land use and real estate development. And so this is an area that's, a, and I'm a native Washingtonian, I've lived here almost 58 years. So these housing issues are a passion for me and now what I do by, by day. So as we dive into the comp plan, I wanna share a few numbers. My family moved to Mill Creek on Halloween 2003. In 2003, the population of Mill Creek was 15,643 residents. When we moved here, the residential to the north, I think, had been built, and whatever, it's kind of like Safeco, Central Market, uh, town and country, uh, was just coming out of the ground. By 2010, the census population for Mill Creek was 18,244. That's an increase of 2,601 in that seven years. Now, part of that was due to the annexation, the last annexation we did of the area from 35th East out to Seattle Hill Road. The 2020 census population for Mill Creek is 21,926. That's a 3,682 increase from 2010. For 2044, we'll have a projected population of 24,813 residents. That's an additional 3,887. Now let's put that into housing units. The number of housing units I believe we currently have is around 9,000. To accommodate that additional population projection, we need to provide for 2,617 housing units. It seems daunting, but just as I was reading Bothell's comprehensive plan update yesterday, their population is a little bigger, about 49,000 between the two counties. They need to provide an additional 12,000 housing units to meet the population projection. So we should feel good about the challenge that we have. It's not as big as Bothell's. Um, but we were required by the Growth Management Act to do a 10-year update to our comprehensive plan where we take a look at how we're going to provide for that growth of the, for the protected population. You know, growth can be a four-letter word in most communities, but to me, how we accommodate growth is both our biggest challenge and probably our biggest opportunity. Prior to COVID, Prior to COVID, the council formed a work group to look at the, what we call the Mill Creek Boulevard Center, south of town center going down south of 164th to the QFC, um, and look at what our options were for that area in the future. It's underutilized. We have the Green Line Bus Rapid Transit behind us on 527. The Orange Line Bus Rapid Transit just opened last month on 164th. And someday, I don't know if it'll be in our lifetimes, Light Rail will finally get up to Ashley. Um, but it'll be here one of these days. 
Um, but we looked at, looked at that subarea and what our options were and came up with a series of recommendations for the council to consider, including looking at putting housing there. I think one of the challenges for the council is I deal with land use stuff on a daily basis. It's hard for, I think, a lot of electeds who don't deal with this stuff to understand the land use and planning issues and understand when you're talking densities and floor area ratios and middle housing and all those sorts of things to visualize what it really looks like. So we held a joint planning session with the Planning Commission back in early February and brought in a developer who's done some of these mixed use developments down in Bothell, Woodenville, and Kenmore to give a presentation on some of the challenges and issues and how they made, made it happen. And I think that discussion led to what I thought was probably the most productive discussion on growth that I've had on the council in my 10 years here. And it resulted in the council giving unanimous direction to the Planning Commission to put together a sub-area plan that would redesignate the entire sub-area uh, for mixed use. So staff is hard at work making that happen. So that was helpful, but what was even more helpful is then two weeks ago, staff organized for us a tour to take us through those developments so we could see it firsthand and learn some of the lessons that these other cities learned from the developments that they did. Um, I think it was eye-opening for a lot of us and has put in context you know, what, how growth can be a good thing and how accommodating growth can be a benefit to our community. Um, now I always tell people, people view housing as a symptom of an illness. I think it's the other way around. The reason we have housing issues is because our economy is booming, our economy is growing. Businesses are expanding, businesses are moving here. Uh, those businesses and the workers need places to live. Um, so somehow we've got to shift the mindset that growth is not a symptom of an illness, it's a symptom of a healthy economy and a vibrant, vibrant area. Um, you know, it's in, kind of, I think it's appropriate that we're sitting here to have this discussion today because when John was here probably in the late 80s, early 90s, when the city leaders were envisioning this, they were looking 10 to 20 years down the road of what the city might, might look like and they came up with this great vision which it took a few years but it finally came to reality. I think the city of Mill Creek is in the same situation with the sub area, you know, looking at how can we make that a sense of place that can be an asset to the community, not have adverse impacts on our existing residential areas, and be a source of economic development and driving our economy. So I think it's a huge opportunity. There's going to be a lot of opportunities for public input over the next, what do we have, eight months? Eight months left to get it done. We have to have it adopted before the end of the year. But that's why I characterize the comprehensive plan as both our greatest challenge and our greatest opportunity. Almost done. Okay. Two more. The DRCC property. This is another one that's been a challenge and the other issue why I wanted to run for a third term is, as many of you know, the city bought, gosh, over 15 years ago the we call the Dobson Renoir property, 10 acres north of Freedom Field. Made a pretty significant investment. I don't remember the exact dollar figure, but I think it was around $5.4 million. And then around that time, they also bought the property across the street, the Cook property, a smaller parcel, now heavily concerned by wetlands. And then uh, in 2019, we bought the, what used to be the church property, just west of Freedom Field. So the city has invested over the last 15 years about $8 million bucks in um, acquiring those properties. Um, but we've gone in fits and starts trying to plan for that and figure out what to do with that property. Uh, we finally started that process. We hired a consultant uh, three years ago, Karen Reed, who's helped guide us through starting to have a discussion with council and staff in the community on what ideas and how we could develop that property. That got put on hold as we then moved our efforts to having a successful annexation to South County Fire. But now we're back on track with putting the DRCC up on the front burner. So just over a year ago, we entered into a contract with a planning firm to help guide us through a master planning process. Uh, we hope to have hope to have complete by about this time next year. Um, I would say where we've been so far, I think we have a consensus developing 
from what we're hearing in the community and the council, you know, we have an opportunity to create a community asset, you know, something that could be a legacy for our community. I don't know what that could be. That's what we're going to figure out over the next year. You know, we have needs for community space. We have probably need better space for our seniors. Uh, we have needs for community gathering space. There's needs for performing arts. There's needs for more, more uh, athletic fields, both indoor and outdoor. So. It's going to be a community engagement process over the next year as we put together this master plan and hopefully come up with a plan that then we can start executing on. And I'll let Stephanie talk about when she talks about the legislature and how we've been able to leverage some state and county funds to help us with some of these projects. But you know, and I also I forgot to mention the Boys and Girls Club also still has a big interest in putting a facility and working with us on a, on doing something here. So right now we're trying to figure out what we have. There are a few wetlands on the property, so until we know what is there and what area we have to develop, we can't figure out what to do with it. But uh, that process is well underway. Um, so I think opportunity, like I said, is creating a community asset. The biggest challenge is not dreaming big. You know, what I've told council in our discussions is don't start thinking about the cost because if you start thinking about the cost, you're going to give up your dreams of what you could do with the property. So let's dream big, come up with an idea, and then figure out how we can make it happen. We're not going to find out if we don't try. So we're heading down that path with a great abandon coming up in the coming year. And finally, ARPA implementation, so I'll try to be brief on this one. So we got, as a result of the ARPA funds, a little over $5.8 million. Uh, we spent a bulk of the time with staff in 2013 figuring out how to best implement that, uh, those funds for the city. So there's, I think, three different areas that I would, we call them buckets that I put this in. One is, you know, there's a lot of things that the city has not been able to get to that were needed just because of lack of resources, whether it be human capital or, or money. So we put some money into some relatively mundane things that to you and me don't, may not matter, but the staff are critical. So a GIS system for our public infrastructure to help public works assess what we have with water and sewer issues. Personnel policies, both for staff and the police. Uh, website redesign, which is critical, it is a critical interface with the community, and we want to make sure it works well and is functional and gets information out. Updating the telephone system, updating the uh, software system we use, and also using some of the funds to offset the cost of doing our comprehensive plan update. But we've also dedicated some money to public safety on the police front. We funded the deputy public safety director's position. Uh, we're working on a citywide security system for the parks. As you probably know, we've had some issues with vandalism, particularly the bathrooms at Freedom Field, which is frustrating and results in the bathrooms being closed. So we're hoping that with this system we can uh, de deter some of that pause. And the last area is the, the one that's probably the biggest. It's the clean safe and well maintained. You know, we're just over 40 years old as a community now. I like to say we're in our adolescence. You know, the hair's getting a little long, we need to be trimmed up and look a little better, but not just in the short term, in the long term as well. So we're making some investments to clean and make sure the city is well maintained. So I'm sure that Scott and Jody are gonna have a big event planned when we roll out our new street sweeper when it arrives in about six weeks. Uh, we're not getting rid of the old one, and we'll still have it, but we're going to have a bigger, better, and more efficient street sweeper so we can keep up with the uh, maintenance of the streets. Uh, we've been putting a lot of effort, Scott and Jody, on the wayfinding signs to have better uh, direction. And when we hear this, particularly from the senior community, uh, better wayfinding signs throughout the city. We're updating some of the signage. Some of the signage shall we say it's a bit dated. Um, but, but we, so that is in process and underway. We have new decorative seasonal banners and decorations for all the events, the Memorial Day events, the, the Veterans Day events, the holiday events. Um, those were getting a little ragged as well. And then the last item was, you know, we have a lot of roadway buffers and medians throughout the city. And 
they can be good, but oftentimes what happens is they end up getting overgrown. So we're putting some money towards figuring out how we can work, not just within the city on the areas we're responsible for, but work with the HOAs, because a lot of those areas, like for instance along Seattle Hill Road as you drive up the hill, those are part of HOAs for the residential community. So we've got to figure out a way to work with them to make sure those areas are maintained. But we're trying to beautify the city, not just to make it look good in the short term, but find a way to make it look good over the long haul. So that took longer than I should have. But we had a lot to cover because there's a lot of good stuff happening. So I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie, and then we'll wrap it up and turn it over to Q&A. Thank you, Mayor. Um as Mayor said, I am Stephanie Vignal, and I am the Mayor Pro Tem for the City of Mill Creek. And I want to thank all of you for coming out today. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces and to have you here to hear our uh, first state of the city in, in this format. So I'm very excited to be here today with you. Um, today, I'm going to talk about public safety and our legislative priorities. Public safety is a top priority for the city council. When I was out doorbelling with my daughter, many of you told us that one of your top priorities was seeing increased presence of police officers out. And one of the top priorities that you mentioned was a concern was the amount of people that are speeding in our community. You told me this so often that if you ask my daughter what is the number one issue of the city of Mill Creek, she will tell you that people are speeding. That is what was drilled into her. So with that information, council has heard you. And we talked to the city manager, and we talked to the police chief, and we set this as one of our priorities. So Chief White worked on implementing, beginning to implement a plan to increase the presence of our police officers in our city, started last year. And he's going to continue to work on that presence this year and increasing the presence and we are starting to see an impact. I don't know if you've realized but I've seen our officers pulling people over, especially on Seattle Hill Road um, when I'm out running and see that they're talking to people and just last night we were given information that we have increased our contacts by about 250% I believe it was for this time, for this quarter last, over this quarter last year. So that's a significant impact, and all of you should be able to be seeing them out and about and having contacts with everyone and hopefully start to see a reduction in people speeding since it is such a, a concern for everyone. Staffing has also been a concern for, for us in the police department. As many of you had heard, it's been a conversation we've been having over the past few years. Um, we've actively been recruiting and making this a priority to get the, the police department back up and fully staffed to its budgeted numbers. Currently, we are happy to report that as of today, all the positions that are budgeted currently have been filled. We're very excited about that to share that great news. What this means is that we have 23 full-time commissioned officers, 16 of those are currently on duty. One is an officer in training, so he's a field officer in training, and we have four that are currently waiting for the academy, and then they will be um, in, in the field training as well. Moving forward, we'll continue to monitor this and see once they're fully staffed and see, as the mayor mentioned, that um, with, the, with the staff in other departments, there may be a need to adjust staffing, so we will keep an eye on this to see if there will be any need for any increased um, adding of, of officers or full-time employees in the police department. Um, I'm going to take a side note from what I wrote while I'm discussing this and just mention, since I discussed that we have four people that are waiting for the police academy right now, I want to highlight that one of the things that was part of our legislative agenda, was supporting Senator Lovick's work that he did on getting regional training um, facilities more um, closer to home. And so that's been a priority that we've had, and it's really um, helpful because if we have more training facilities right here in our neighborhoods, then those people, it opens it up so that more people from diverse backgrounds can go and get trained. They live here, 
they are part of our community, they're part of our culture, and it just helps with, with the culture and the presence and also opens up for, for people who right now, this, they may want to serve and it may not be open to them just because they can't go away for weeks at a time to go get training. Um, also right now, the chief is overseeing our deputy of public safety, um, <laughs> working on updating all of our police policies to make sure that they are current and up to date. And we're also working with the Snohomish County uh, Department of Emergency Management to make sure that we have updated our emergency preparedness because programs so that everybody knows what to do in case of an emergency. We're also currently exploring ways for techno with technology that we can increase public safety in our community in a way that complements the current policing. Some of the conversations um, that we will be having are um, around speed cameras. We've heard from many in our community that they would like to, us to look into speed cameras. And recently we had a mayor chat that that was a huge topic that we had um, available. So we are going to look into that and start the discussions. There's been no decisions made on that yet, but we will um, talk about it and, and research it. And also, uh, just last night, we discussed flock cameras, which uh, would also help complement um, the efforts of our police and keep us safe and we'll look at any other technologies that would be of assistance as well. Next I want to talk a little bit about our legislative agenda. One of my personal top priorities was to establish a more consistent presence with our representatives in Olympia and to stay abreast of the impacts of any legislation that they have discussed and be an open dialogue and conversation with them. I'm excited to say that we have established a legislative committee. It is comprised of myself, Council Member Duque, who's here, and Council Member Allison, to, to work on putting together the yearly agenda approved by the council and then guide our discussions with our representatives. This year, we had our, cat our priorities fell into five different categories. Funding for operations and city infrastructure and capital projects, public safety, land use growth management act, public records reform, and transportation. As a result of this, we were able to fully engage with our delegation in Olympia, have conversations with them on bills that were important to us. We were able to have multiple conversations regarding the transit-oriented development bills, let them know how Mill Creek is impacted by, by them, and have an open dialogue. And we also sent letters of testimony over the past few years um, from the council, as well as letters to different representatives and different committees, letting them know where, where we stand, how different legislation will impact our city, and let them know what's important to us. As a result of these discussions, we have, and the um, increased relationship building that we have been engaged in, we are so excited to say that we have um, been able to tangibly bring home um, quite a few grants for the city that are gonna have a nice impact on us. And um, I just wanna list off a couple of those so that you know the work that we've been doing. Um, first off, I want to say um, we received a state grant about, of about $1 million for the DRCC to help us with the site plan, um, and that was something that Representative Berg really uh, championed to make sure that we receive. We have also received um, a grant of $500,000 that Rep Berg, Rep Berg uh, worked on for um, HVAC in City Hall North. I don't know if you know, but the HVAC is not has some issues in City Hall North. And so when we're trying to use the City Hall North as an asset for the community so that you can actually have meetings in there, it, it kind of makes it a little difficult. So these renovations and the roof renovation as part of that will make it so that you can actually benefit you so you can actually come and be able to use the space more and it'll be an asset for you. So this is something we're really excited about. Um, Something else that I'm really excited about is the money that we were able to receive um, 
that Rentberg helped with as well for the library subfloor and HVAC repairs. This is extremely important. I don't know if you know that the city actually owns the building that the library is in and they pretty much lease the space. So we're responsible to help maintain the building. And if you go to the library often, as I do, you know that the floor is squishy. And in the summer, it is not um, very cool. And so this is a problem. So we are so excited that we were able to receive these funds. And Redbird worked really hard to get those for us. And if any of you have any questions regarding the renovations that will be coming in the library as a result of these funds, we do have Vanessa and RD um, here today to um, answer any questions. If you have those, you can reach out to them and ask them. Um, finally, we also have received a grant of 88,000 from the state and a county grant of 100,000 to work on um, improvements to Silvercrest Park. If you have been out there, you know that this is an older park that we annexed into, the, into Mill Creek a while ago. And it is not, um, oh, what's the words I want to use? It, it, it needed some maintenance and, and repairs to, to bring it up to standard. And I'm getting the wrap it up from, from back there. Um, also, um, we have received um, a grant for um, improvements of North Creek Trail from um, Council Member Mead um, from the county for 100,000. I'm really excited to be able to get out there and improve the trail because it's one of our best asset assets and one of my favorite assets as well. Um, and we also received um, another 250,000 from Council Member Mead from Snohomish County. And that is for um, Library Park. We're gonna do some work on the drainage. I don't know if you have been out there and realized it's really soggy there as well. Um, so we're wanting to do some renovations there. We're doing a study to see what we need to do to um, make that drainage better out there. And we also received, I believe it was 258,000 from, um, from the legislative this year that Senator Lovick worked really hard on to get us to help expand um, our, to work on our veterans memorial. We have veterans whose names are not able to be on the memorial because we've run out of space and he worked very hard along with his friend Chuck Wright um, to, um, to try to bring us some funds for that so that we can start to look into that. Um, they told me I need to wrap up. I was supposed to discuss challenges and staying on top of things, but um, challenges, but uh, I guess I'll just leave it in at this happy no no challenges everything is great so i will leave it there and i want to thank all of you for coming out today um and i don't know if the mayor has anything else to say to wrap up i think scott wants us to throw it open to questions before we do I, as i'm looking at chief white i completely forgot to acknowledge him as another person that got promoted from within a long time officer on our police department who ended up becoming our police chief. So as we, we talked a lot, but it's because there's a lot of good things happening. Uh, and a lot of exciting stuff and important decisions to make. Oh, and we're also supposed to announce there's too much food, so please help yourself to some more. So Scott, do we have time for a few questions? Food first. So no questions? They go through and they get numbers from OSPI at the state level about the projected population and 
look at the comp plan and projected growth. So that's something we don't we hear a lot about, but we don't get involved with. So um, I mean, I know April dealt with that quite a bit when she was on the school board in, uh, in Everett. Um, um, thank you. I, I just wanted to add that the, the mayor's right. This is something that the legislature um, should be working on in the school boards. This is not something that the city council can work on. But I do want to let you know that those of us on city council, um, this is a priority that we we have that's in a different wheelhouse. And we are in communication with um, Representative Burke, for instance, and we, we do talk to them, have those discussions and let them know how growth is impacting our schools, what, what it means to our children, you know, um, having to be important, to share and be in split classes, just for me, my things I'm dealing with personally. So we are having those conversations and engaging so that they know what's happening in, in the area because they can't be everywhere and know everything. So I just wanted to let you know that we, even though we don't handle it, we, we are having discussions and making sure they understand what we're, what we're dealing with. Thank you. You're welcome. One, um, this is kind of a side. Do y'all have any control um, over Snohomish, uh, like Linwood, for example? I've called the sheriff office before, and you would not believe what they told me over the phone when I told them about larceny that was happening repeatedly. Um, do y'all are y'all related to them at all since it's still Snohomish, or is that completely separate? It's completely separate. <laughs> And Chief is telling me it's not us. <laughs> and that's, would you like to know what they told me? Uh, I'm sure the Chief would like to know the details afterwards. Yeah. But I, that was a very quick one. I do have one aside when it comes to housing, especially since you said you were okay. an expert. Um, I have watched housing get less and less affordable the past 11 years that I've been out on my own. And it was exactly the same issue. Atlanta had the same issue that Seattle does. It's the exact same price. And then when you have the rent go up increasingly and then they're controlling it, it actually does hurt the local economy. Because if you're paying extra thousands of dollars for your rent, you can't spend it. And you're already getting taxed so hard, then it's less money to actually put into the economy. And I really do think that that should be considered and maybe put some limits with the government saying that you you can't, once you have a certain square footage in an area, you can't keep increasing a certain percentage or go over a certain amount because the place we're living at was 1300 two years ago. Currently, we're paying 2500 And please explain to me why that we decrease that much. And and he actually makes, a, he has a very good job, and I'm even fortunate we're there. But as you see, that's kind of an issue that I feel is not being addressed by government. And those are the only people who can do it because if we don't have those rights or those laws protecting us, of course they're going to take advantage of us. 12.54, we only have six minutes left. <laughs> no, 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 that's an important question, but it's a, it's a bit of a loaded question because the government certainly has a role, but a big function of it is the laws that the state adopts, drawing the lines around the urban growth areas and limiting the supply of land you have to develop. Um, and again, it's a complicated question. It is a problem because housing is more and more unaffordable. I've got a son graduating from college next week in Arizona. And he's not sure if he wants to move back here because he just can't afford to live here. And I'm not sure I want him to move back because he doesn't have a job yet, and I don't want him to move <laughs> But that's another issue. So no, that that is an important issue, and that's one of the reasons why we're looking at at the sub areas. We we need more housing choices. To, we need more supply, um, and so that's one way we could do that. I mean. And I think it's important to keep in mind, too, we're not going to make housing prices go down. What we've got to do is keep them from accelerating so steeply, and that's that's the challenge. And I'm not sure there's one silver bullet that provides all the answers. I tell people that the answer to our housing problem is D. It's all of the above. Benjamin. Member of our planning commission. Yeah, hello. Uh, this actually doesn't have to do with planning commission. Uh, I, one thing I've talked about with a number of my neighbors is actually we are very happy to see the increased presence of police in our neighborhoods uh, and doing traffic enforcement, etc. It's really a good thing, and it's something that I know we've all been asking for for a long time. And so I'm really glad that we're seeing that and seeing the enforcement going on there. One aspect of that visibility is that I'd like us to use very clearly marked cars. We have, I've seen 
I've seen five different cars pulled over. Three times it's been one of our vehicles which has very low contrast uh, markings. And so it's difficult to see that that's a legitimate cruiser with legitimate right to pull you over. And I want to make sure that any of our residents who get pulled over by the city of Mill Creek are not confused, are not unsure, are not going to call into the police, the police department first while still driving and heading, honking all the way with their lights blaring into a gas station or whatever like we've all been warned to do if you think this isn't legitimate. I don't want to see that through our neighborhoods. Uh, I'd really like to see us um, use uh, our most clearly marked vehicles to do that. And I don't know if we can see about changing that or if there is a, if we need to change the paint on our cars or what to make that happen. I know we do have a couple of unmarked and low contrast and the unmarked I know has some rules about how it's used. Um, and I just want to see if we can make that visibility really highly visible. And that helps us with public safety in many aspects. Noted and Chief can take that into consideration when the five vehicles we authorized to be acquired a couple weeks ago get delivered here in the months ahead. Any other final questions? Thank you everyone for coming.